Welcome to In Touch with Northern Michigan. I'm State Senator Michelle McManus from the 35th State Senate District, and today's guest is Ken Verana, and Ken is the president of the Center for Maritime and Underwater Resource Management. I've known Ken mm -hmm. for a long time, so it's great to have him here to talk a little bit about our Great Lakes and our Great Lake State Park, we hope. Uh, but before we get there, how about if we uh, spend a little time telling the viewers a little bit about your background? Sure, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh -huh. These are my favorite topics, of course. Sure. Um, I've been a professional in the fields of uh, coastal recreation and tourism and underwater archaeology for nearly 30 years now. Uh -huh. um, started out here in Michigan at Isle Royal National Park. Okay. That was back in 1976 when the park was trying to figure out what to do with these historic shipwrecks they had in their boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, they were receiving quite a bit of attention from sport divers, uh, yet the National Park Service hadn't fully recognized these types of sites as a venue for recreation and, and tourism. And uh, that kind of propelled my, uh, my career because the National Park Service also uh, started up uh, what they considered a ground-breaking uh, project in underwater archaeology uh, with the Submerged Cultural Resources Unit. And uh, eventually, after about nine years at Isle Royal, uh, I went on to working with the Submerged Cultural Resources Unit. Right here in Lansing, or is it, was Act it up in UP too? Or? Believe it or not, it was in northern New Mexico. Oh, ha! Huh. All <laughs> uh, right. It, at first, an a odd, warmer climate. Yes, an odd place uh, for an underwater sure. archaeology unit, but that was one of the National Park Service's prime uh, cultural resource centers. Okay. So from there, uh, I investigated shipwrecks all all over the U.S. and the Western Pacific. Okay. So when we talk about the Center for Maritime and Underwater Resource Management, what are we referring to? Where where is that organization located first? That's a Michigan organization. Okay. Um, it started out first at Michigan State University after I left the National Park Service to come back home. Okay. Kind of missed this fresh water. Yeah. And you wanted a colder and friends. climate, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that cool fresh water. Uh -huh. um, and it was first started at Michigan State University in the, in the Department of Park Recreation and Tourism Resources and to form kind of a bridge between the fields of archaeology and anthropology and the revenue side, which is generally in the fields of park development, mm -hmm. recreation, and, and, and tourism. Um, we spun off from MSU as an organization uh, back in 2000, and the center became a private nonprofit. Uh, okay, but it is located here in Lansing. Yes, in now, the Lansing Now, when folks think of the Great Lakes and the Great Lake bottomlands, mm -hmm. Uh, what kind of mass of land are we talking about? How big is that? Um, it's huge. <laughs> um, over 38,000 square miles uh -huh. just within Michigan's boundaries. Um, so when we say 38,000 what 38, square miles, mm -hmm. so what's down there that's so interesting to see? Um, pretty much examples of every habitation period. Mm -hmm. uh, here on the Great Lakes, uh, starting with Aboriginal or, or Native American remains through um, contact with uh, European cultures that started with fur trading and then, of course, logging and agriculture and, mm -hmm. and minerals development. And, and a byproduct of all that economic activity and settlement, of course, are historic shipwrecks. And so there's a lot of them here in the Great Lakes, historic yes. shipwrecks. Can you, how many do you think there are? I think fairly, uh, by some historians' estimates, 5,000 to 10,000 shipwrecks. Of course, uh, they're dealing with different types of sites. You've got to be careful on how they uh, uh, define uh, what they're considering as shipwrecks. Sure. Um, in Michigan, back in the late uh, 1970s, the Michigan DNR commissioned a study with Bowling Green State University to estimate how many large commercial vessels may exist in uh, Michigan's coastal waters, mm -hmm. and that figure was about 1,300. Okay. So um, when are you a diver? 
Yes. Okay. I see that you're wearing your little uh, diver tag. Yes. And um, you, you said something earlier before we started, and really surprising for me, that that actual symbol started right here in the Great Lakes. Yes, the, uh, the red and white um, mm-hmm. dive flag, which is known all around the world, uh, was an invention of the Michigan Skin Diver Council back okay. in the late uh, 50s, early 60s, um, as a means of in essence warning boaters <laughs> that yeah. there was diving activity mm-hmm. below and it was uh, quickly adopted by other diving groups throughout the United States. Mm. So I've been a, a diver since 1979. Um, I've logged uh, now about a thousand operational and scientific dives. Those are just work dives during okay. my career. Uh, you've probably seen technology and diving equi- equipment change over the years, haven't you? Yeah, incredible, uh, yeah. Uh, especially in terms of the electronics and oh, sure. computer systems that we have for search, discovery, and documentation mm-hmm. of these sites now. So do you think that underwater diving um, for tourism is really uh, hasn't seen its high use yet? I mean, it's it's pretty a new new kind of activity, wouldn't you say? Absolutely, here? and it's technology driven too. I, I mean, cooler waters like the Great Lakes uh, initially were a deterrent uh, to uh, development of such areas as a dive destination. But now we have dry suits and even warm water suits and, uh-huh. and technologies. Uh, that that make uh, the diving experience uh, very comfortable even in cooler waters. Yeah, I think that's an important aspect because I went diving last year in, geez, it was August, I believe. Mm-hmm. And after I got down um, probably 20, 30 feet, it was quite cool. Yes. I mean, there were people that didn't have a hood and didn't have gloves, and I could tell that they were a little cold. Um, so having the right equipment certainly helps in the, the comfort level, as you expressed. Uh, for diving under the water. Well, why is uh, the Great Lakes, is they're, they're becoming a uh, kind of a destination spot for diving, wouldn't you say? Yes. Uh, and and what, why is that? Is there just a new awareness uh, si- situation or? I, I think awareness plays into it. Uh, there's no question we have some of the best preserved historic shipwrecks literally on earth. Um, and I can testify to that fact uh, from my travels uh, all over the globe uh, in a professional capacity. Um, Those uh, cool fresh waters that on one hand may have challenged divers in the past in terms of uh, warmth Mm -hmm. also provide to them some unique experiences, literally storybook types of uh, shipwrecks and and sites where uh, you find wooden schooners with the masts up, even uh, sailing uh, rig uh, hmm. and sails, uh, in some cases still visible, um, not in a complete form, but remnants. And sure. uh, from our underwater archaeology, that's very exciting when you're used to looking uh, primarily at uh, s- uh, small bits and pieces in ocean environments, especially hmm. of uh, wooden vessels. What are some really um, interesting objects to see in our Great Lakes? You said you've gone all over. Are there anything that you would point to as some uh, destination spots for divers? Well, our underwater preserve system uh, here in Michigan, I think, is extremely notable because these have been primarily community-based attempts to feature certain types of resources just off of our coastal communities and therefore spark Um, additional recreation and underwater uh, tourism. So shipwrecks, of course, um, and particularly the older wooden vessels that you just don't see much of in ocean environments. Um, But there's also some very interesting geological features within our Great Lakes from the sedimentary uh, rock formations like sinkholes, 